what happened? That was really weird. The color just went totally wacko on my camera. I don't know why. Uh, it's the lighting. It is a little weird today. I try to use as much natural lighting as possible and sometimes that's what you get. Not consistent light. We'll just do our best. with the Chirp YouTube channel. Today I'm here with another video in my series on helping kids learn to talk. The purpose of this series is to give you short little hints that will be easy to implement so that you can keep on tuning up your skills when it comes to helping your kids or your students. I have lots of videos that are meant more as a more intensive training into a particular topic, more of a deep dive. This series is meant to be more short and easier to implement so that you can just pick this one thing that I'm talking about, put it into practice, and see the benefits. In that previous video, I think it was this one, I talked about how automatic speech comes from a different place in your brain than does self-initiated creative speech, like using sentences, communicating a story that happened to you, things like that. Automatic speech is speech that we learn so well that our brain memorizes it and keeps it somewhere else. Not in the speech, actually, I guess it's the left side, not in the speech center of your brain. Think about one, two, or ready, set, or Mary had a little, or five little jumping on up. All these in your brain, probably, if you grew up as I did, if you have the same sort of background culturally that I do, your brain probably filled in all of those blanks for you without any work from the communication center of your brain. The fact that automatic speech comes from a different place in your brain than does creative speech means that we can leverage automatic speech to kind of kickstart verbal communication for some of our kids who are not yet verbal communicators. It also helps if people have had strokes or if people have things such as acquired brain injuries that inhibit their creative speech area of the brain. But right now we're going to focus on kids because that's what I do the most and that's what I like the best. I'm going to show you some of the toys in my toy box that I use to stimulate automatic speech. The goal behind this always being that once that automatic speech becomes more normal, feels better, that the pathway between the brain and the motor movements that the mouth needs to make will get smoother. Even though it's a different pathway, the mouth will get used to speaking words and what typically happens is that the automatic speech comes first along with singing and then later bits of more creative speech come in. A lot of times around the automatic speech. A lot of times kids will use the automatic speech and then sort of use that in more places and then we'll start to expand it a little more. So it's a really helpful bridge to more creative language use and more expanded language use. The first thing I'm going to show you today is my very cute little monkeys jumping on the bed set. Here's the bed. This has been used and abused for many years. I probably should wash it, huh? But it still looks pretty good. It's very cute. Little blanket. And then we have one. I don't need to count all the monkeys for you, but that's number three. Where's number two? Two, three. This is number five. Oh good, I still have all the monkeys. That would be sad. 
four, five. Okay, <laughs> look at their little faces. They're so cute. There's the monkeys. Here's the mama. Her dress needs to be mended. But isn't she cute? She's not jumping on the bed. Oh, the bed has a pillow. That really makes my little home decor heart happy. And here's the doctor. So cute. His little jacket comes off. I always hated it as a child when people were dressed, or monkeys in this case, were dressed and you couldn't get their clothes off. I didn't care what was under there. I just wanted to be able to change their clothes because I don't want to wear the same thing every day. Why should he have to wear the same thing every day? If you don't know this little rhyme, usually I do this in quite a violent way because it makes kids laugh and it embeds the language part of it even deeper. So I'll usually hold it on the floor and I'll make all the monkeys jump up and down like this. Five little monkeys jumping on the bed. And then I'll grab one, number five, and I throw him. If he can hit the wall, even better. Let's see what I can manage. They have sand in the bottom. They're pretty sturdy. So I throw him and I say, one fell off and bonked his head or hit his head or bashed his head, whatever language. I think it, all of these are appropriate. Mama called the doctor and the doctor said, no more monkeys jumping on the bed. I try to make the mama face, my face when I'm holding the mama, seem very worried because all this monkey fell off and he hit his head and who knows what's gonna happen. And I try to make the doctor sound really stern and angry. Not because doctors are always stern and angry, but because it's affect that I want my kids to be absorbing. And I do it over and over again, and then all the monkeys come back and they cuddle with mommy, and doctor, you know, is nice and says, oh, everyone's fine, I'm glad you're all fine. That is monkeys jumping on the bed. You don't have to have these monkeys, you don't have to have a cute little set that comes in a bag. You don't have to have any of that, but you, you can make all of this yourself. You can do it with paper. It doesn't matter. It's just a really fun activity that involves lots of automatic language. And because it's so repetitive, the automatic language comes even quicker and you can use it in lots of situations. You can imagine if your child were potentially feeling sick one day, if the monkeys jumping on the bed were a common game that you play in your house, then maybe your child might say, mama called doctor. And those words would already be words that are regularly used. So it wouldn't seem quite as difficult to communicate that as it otherwise might if we hadn't played this game. I want to include here the fact that if your child is not engaged in these things, then these activities are, are a step too high for your child's current interest level. If your child likes to climb up on stuff and jump off, then the automatic language that you need to be practicing is ready, set, go, and then the child jumps or you help the child jump. That's what I usually did. I didn't let kids just jump off stuff because that's not engaging for me. I mean, that's not a relational activity. I would hold their hands and then I'd say, ready, set, go. And then I would lift her up and then she would jump down even further. And it was more fun because I made it more fun because I made it higher. She got to go even higher. That's the kind of thing you want to be doing if your kid is at that level. If your kid is not interested in equipment, in toys, in rote rhymes, don't do it. But most kids, once they reach a certain level of engagement, are interested in this kind of stuff. The more sensory based we can make it, the more likely kids are going to be to be interested. The more sensory based it is, the more likely it is that kids will be interested. My next recommendation is dominoes. I have two sets here, a regular size set, and then someone donated this super cute little mini set to me. I don't recommend dominoes for kids who might eat them because you can imagine this clogging up an airway. These would probably go right down, but still, we don't want to eat these. But look how cute they are, they're so tiny. 
I really love these. I don't have a full set of these, but for what I'm gonna recommend, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna recommend that you stand them up like this on the floor, a solid floor, like a tile floor or a wood floor or a table, but tables are jiggly and it tends to be a little more frustrating. So I like the floor, as long as you're not having an earthquake. Stand them up, not too many, 10 to 20. Usually I start with 10 because the kids that I work with usually can't wait longer than that. And then we say, ready, set, and we push them down. It is fun. Kids like this. I sometimes increase the challenge factor by taking pictures of, I don't think I have these with me. Nope. Taking pictures of different shapes that I can make with the dominoes. So an S, a Y, a T, a circle, a spiral. And then I let the kids pick which shape they want me to make next. If your kid is getting really excited and wants to make the shapes herself, it's not a bad idea to start with the dominoes this way. They still tip over and they're not quite so tippy as having them up the vertical way. Usually with dominoes, I use ready, set, go. As the process goes along, you want to stop saying the last part so that the kid will fill that in. Like with five little monkeys jumping on the... One fell off and bumped his... Mama called the doctor and the doctor said... That's how I usually do it in my classroom. And even kids who are very minimally verbal really try because we've made the game really fun. Same with dominoes. If I say ready, set, and I'm holding my finger right there, ready to push. Now given, you have to be careful that the kid just doesn't swoop in and, and push, push it himself because that usually does happen. So usually I'll hold the kid on my lap and I'll hold the kid's finger and we'll together, we'll point very close to that last domino that we need to push to make them all go. And I'll say ready, set, go, and we'll push it together. That's one of the help things if your child has difficulty with delayed gratification. And don't most of us have difficulty with delayed gratification? Yes, we do. My next recommendation for automatic speech toys is rocket balloons. I am going to even blow one up for you today. This is very exciting. I've only done this in my classroom before because most of the time my toys are in a classroom. Right now, they're in my home. Let's see, I think I'll do a pink one because that blue one was a little weird. Okay, so you push it on. We can do pump, pump, pump as we're pumping it up. You can't really see, I have to hold it up a little higher. As I pump this thing, the balloon gets bigger. My husband's on a work meeting right now. <laughs> so as I let this go, hopefully it doesn't disturb his meeting too much. not going to be able to show you how this balloon zooms because I'm going to leave the camera on its tripod. Got to make sure that this part is smooth because otherwise it won't make the fantastic noise it's about to make. Now here is the automatic speech part. I have two different countdown boards in here. For kids who are just learning, we start with five, four, three, two, one, blast off! And for kids who are a little more advanced when it comes to being able to verbally say stuff, we count down from 10 instead of just from five. You can just have one board and take these off, but I find that if you take things off too much, then they get lost. And in fact, you don't even really need a board that where you can take the numbers off. You can just have the numbers printed on a piece of cardboard and you just point to them as you go down. We just pretty much point to these. So here goes the part you want to do with your kids. Five, four, three, two, one, blast off! <laughs> it actually worked quite well because you could hear it and you could see it fall down when it was done. In a normal environment, the balloon will swerve around like this. And not only is it a good activity for 
working on automatic speech, it's a really good activity for eye tracking. Kids in our day and age, especially kids with any sort of developmental delay, have difficulty with eye tracking. So reading becomes difficult because their eyes are not used to, to moving from side to side that way. A lot of times we'll sit, seat our kids directly in front of things we want them to be looking at, whereas it's very good for us to be able to pay attention to information and stimuli that are coming from an angle, from the sides or from our periphery as well. We need to be able to learn from that also. So this activity, because the balloon swerves and the kid is naturally motivated to follow the balloon with her eyes, it's a really great activity as a pre-reading practice. Balloons, excellent. My cat is sitting right here, very interested in what I have been doing. And my dominoes are falling everywhere. This is awesome. <laughs> We're having so much fun today. My next activity is bowling. This is another game where it's going to pretty much be ready, set, go. And you can also use numbers. I have this little little Tykes bowling set that I've had for probably 15 years. It's in a little bit rough shape, but it still works. Um, it has five pins, nope, six pins. So what that means is I can put one pin and then two pins and then three pins, and I have a little triangle, just like a normal 10 pin bowling triangle would be. I replaced the plastic bowling ball with this medicine ball. This weighs four pounds, so it's pretty heavy. The reason I did that was number one, the plastic bowling ball made a horrible noise in the classroom on the floor. I just, I, it sounded like, I don't know, crabs crawling across the floor. I didn't like it. And number two, I really, number two, it wasn't durable. Number three, I wanted to make this activity more of a calming activity and therefore I wanted to get some heavy work involved. I tend to have kids anywhere from 2 to 18 in my program and once I get back to doing classroom based activities I'm going to buy more sizes and weights of this ball so that my little guys can use the 4 pound one and maybe my big one. my older students who are physically bigger can actually use an 8 or 10 pound medicine ball for this activity. Heavy work like holding this ball, carrying it from one end where you just knock down pins to the other end of the classroom tends to be very calming and soothing for most of our kids. I'm feeling calm just by holding this medicine ball because it weighs four pounds. It's like having a heavy blanket on you feeling very calm and soothed. Normally I will have the kids set these up. I have little tape X's on the floor where the kids know that it's that's where you set the pins up. We can count during that time. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six pins. All right, sit down. And then I have another piece of tape that says sit on it. I always require in my classroom that if we're going to play bowling, it's a sit game. We do a wide V angle on our legs and we roll the ball because I don't allow throwing of balls in my classroom. I may be weird, but throwing of anything in my classroom is always a little iffy. I do have one exception and that is if I have a kid who likes to throw stuff, I have bean bags in my classroom and I have a little bookcase, very small. It's like, I think it's for shoes, but I have put little point totals on each of the cubbies. And so if a kid really needs to throw stuff, sometimes that's how kids calm themselves. Then I give them, I give him the six bean bags and encourage him to throw them into the cubbies. And then we celebrate and rejoice because each of the cubbies has a different points total. And so if you can get it into the one that is worth 10 points, then yay! If you can get it into the cubby with only one point, that's still great. Let's try the one that's five or the one that's 10. That's a really good strategy for kids who like to throw stuff at walls or who need to throw stuff. We always redirect towards that activity 
if a kid is, for example, throwing a crayon at someone's head or throwing her shoe, we will redirect towards the bean bags. So I do have one thing in my classroom that involves throwing, but other than that, we don't do throwing in my classroom because it's just too dangerous and annoying. So we sit when we bowl and we say, ready, set, go. And the kid pushes the ball. So once again, this is great for encouraging automatic speech because it's engaging. There's a huge sensory component. It makes a loud noise when it crashes. It's very exciting. Everyone cheers and claps. And there's the automatic speech with the ready, set, go. And there's the automatic speech with the counting as you put the pins up. This is the way that kids learn best. They learn best from fun, interactive activities that are enjoyable for them and that are relational. I guess fun, interactive, and enjoyable and relational are the same thing. I have one more thing for you on this topic, and this is not exactly automatic speech. It is sounds. Kids who have difficulty producing verbal language sometimes have a lot easier time producing sounds. In this case, it kind of counts as automatic speech because they also are coming from a different area of the brain, sound effects. So we want to definitely encourage sound effects. I encourage animal sounds. I have a little farm with wooden animals. And in fact, I have loaned this to a friend of mine who's an occupational therapist, the actual item. So I don't have it with me to show you the little creatures, but you get the idea. Play with a farm set. Play with your forest creatures. Actually, I don't know that forest creatures have such distinctive noises. After all, what does a fox say? But maybe a jungle animal set, or mostly the farm animals are the ones that kids tend to know. So get a little farm, play farm animals, get vehicles and make vehicle noises. Those are great ideas when we're working on automatic speech. Hope you got some good ideas from this video and let me know how it works for you and your kid or your students. Have a great week. I'll see you in my next video. Bye.